All righty, guys. Thank you all for bearing with me. Uh, we've got a, a wonderful show today. I'm been very intrigued to hear about uh, our guest story today because we're going to get to hear from a 101st Airborne veteran who finds his way or makes his way into MACV SOG serving at FOB1 with, <clears throat> excuse me, ST New Jersey. And uh, he, he, I've been getting to know him and he's a going to be a wonderful source for info with the 101st and for FOB1. So I think we're in store for a great show. I hope you guys are ready and going to have some great questions. But uh, before I talk too much, let me go ahead and hand it off to our guest and let him introduce himself today. Mr. Mike, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Okay. My name's Mike Krofchek. Uh Live in Northern Virginia. Married. 52 years, uh, two, two kids, adult kids in their late forties and four grandchildren. And I'm a veteran of the 101st in a rifle company and MacV SOG. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, like I, like I said, uh, we've, we've kind of spanned the gambit here of, of getting some, some air crews in, uh, we've had some force recon veterans join us. Um, but overall, it's just been straight SF to SOG uh, men from, from the various FO or CNCs. Um, could you kind of uh, talk to us a little bit of, of well, first, uh, your entrance into the military and with the 101st, could you talk a little bit about joining up and uh, where where did you go for boot camp? The uh, I was raised in a military family. Uh, my, my father was a career officer, retired a full bird. And, uh, I was always interested in history, military history. And I don't know whether I was a junior scene, you know, wherever I was in high school, I read a book called Curry and, you know, that tripped my uh, interest in paratroopers and, uh, when I was, uh, I turned 18 on a Monday, but the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Sunday, I turned 18 and Monday I was at the recruiter's office and enlisted in the only stipulation, you know, when you have a choice was airborne and that's where it started. <laughs> that's great. And, uh, what year did you say you joined? 66 66 wow okay so it was about to it was about to start heating up i mean it wasn't of course there as, when it was getting into 68 but things were about to start ramping up heavily uh where uh what well, you said you you were going airborne so you really didn't have uh have to make up your mind or anything um what what was uh what was basic training or boot camp like for you uh, when you got there, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, went to basic training, Fort Leonard Wood, often referred to as Fort Lost in the Woods. <laughs> and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, at, from there, uh, went to Fort Lewis for AI infantry, AIT. And from there to jump school. Uh, upon completion of jump school, I was at, I was sent to Fort Campbell. And, uh, when I got to the, uh, replacement, you know, uh, company, uh, I had 11 boo MOS, but because I got sold a bunch of BS by a signal guy who said, you know, we need some signal people. And with your test scores and all that, you know, and, uh, you know, he's given the sales pitch and he says, you know, you go to one of the infantry battalions, you're going to be sloshing through mud, all this. And we ride everywhere. We got heat. We, you know, and I said, okay, I'll try it. Well, I got to the 501st signal company and it was probably one of the most chicken shit outfits I'd ever spent time in. And uh, there were 
couple of guys I met there. One of them ended up being KIA. And uh, so anyway, to make a long story short, uh, there was a bulletin put out, uh, a notice on that was to be posted on all unit bulletin boards about a, a battalion that's formed to go to Vietnam and make a combat jump. And uh, that was supposed to be on all unit bulletin boards. However, it wasn't on the 50, our 501st Signal Bulletin Board. And myself and a couple of the other guys, we got together and we contacted the 3rd Battalion 506 uh, office, uh, told them the situation, and they said they'll take care of it. And from that phone call, probably the next day, I spent the next two weeks in hell, you know, all four of us did, because they didn't like us going around their back and getting out of that unit. Well, after that, got assigned to the 3rd Battalion, 506, and it was formed with, uh, I would say, probably 80% volunteers, 20%, you know, just out of jump school. We trained extensively. Uh, Colonel Jirasi, who was also F, who was SF, uh, and he was a, a, a Marine in uh, prior life. <laughs> and he, uh, he had gotten two silver stars and a purple heart all in a one month's time. Holy cow. And he drove us unmercifully, you know, kind of like Sobel in the Band of Brothers show. Wow. And uh, some of the guys washed out. And uh, but anyway, we had a, in, in my opinion, a pretty elite infantry battalion, uh, mostly because I think we were all volunteers. We all knew what we signed up for mm -hmm. and went to Vietnam by boat and the, the third of the herd was the other battalion on that ship and on the way there we stopped at subic bay for some minor repairs and that was on a friday and friday afternoon they let us off shipped into the uh, subic bay facility and uh, there were many a drunken gi's uh, and many fights between us, Navy, and Charlie. <laughs> in fact, it was so bad that the next morning they let us off, uh, and then they had an MP, short patrol, whatever, going around rounding us up. The base commander had ordered that ship out of his harbor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so guys were crawling up the gangplank, you know, getting back, and... Uh, the ship's moored, the uh, aircraft carrier Riskany was on the other side of the bay, and these idiots, they were, they were jumping overboard, you know, just to be a, you know, paratrooper being a crazy <laughs> paratrooper. There were sharks in the water. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, everybody starts throwing life jackets and all this crap overboard. And then there's big announcement, stop throwing that. <laughs> and anyway, uh, a small Navy motor launch picked up most of the guys, but there was like three of them that swam between the ship and the dock. And anyway, again, long story short, they ended up the rest of the trip from the Philippines to Vietnam in a brig. Oh, yikes. I, 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 that I, I, that that was a long trip. I can imagine for, for those yeah. boys. <laughs> I think it was twenty four days, something like that. Yeah, uh, on a World War II troop transport, mm. and uh, you know we headed to Vietnam, and as we were approaching, uh, we had a few Vietnam veterans, you know, uh, NCOs and whatever, and uh, as we got within maybe Vietnam on the horizon and it was nighttime. You could see tracers going, you know, see 
uh, red in the sky from explosion. And uh, we thought, man, this is a real thing. And again, we had we had dropped off the third of the herd and a couple smaller units. And then we went to Cameron and uh, we had to, we spent a couple nights uh, dropping people off and one night in Cameron and the secure Navy, I don't know if they were Navy personnel or contractors or what, but they were riding around the boat constantly dropping explosives or hand grenades or something into the water to keep uh, UDT guys from, you know, blowing up the ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're below the water line and that stuff's going off, it's a little hard to sleep. <laughs> so we got done through the initial uh, week, getting organized, getting used to the weather, and then off to Fantheat. And uh, um, from Fantheat, we took over for uh, one of the cab units, and we operated out of Fantheat up to and including the 68 Tet Offensive. Okay, that that's a heck of a heck of a way to, to, to get to Vietnam. I mean, I uh, we're so used to guys hopping on the the airplane and you know getting there immediately and and being done with it. Um, was it kind of like you know speaking of band of brothers and in, in the Pacific? What was it like? that uh, for you guys uh hanging out did, w was there any training going on on deck or are y'all getting ready for anything or mostly just you know mentally preparing and i the training continued in fact we had a week of what they call p training uh at natrang uh that was the first brigade's headquarters and when we got to fancy at you know the company's moved into whatever you know area they were assigned we had gp medium tents on with wooden floors and we were right on the south china sea and nice breeze coming in and uh i was the uh i was an rto radio telephone operator for charlie company and uh during the tet offensive of 68 the uh, we ended up doing street fighting door to door in a, in a big city, you know, not sliding the Marines or anybody else, but, you know, cause we were kind of a bastard uh, task force. Uh, we didn't get the publicity others did, but, and you know, we had over 50% casualties in the battalion. Now that's not all, you know, that's not KIs that's killed and wounded. And uh, one of the things that uh, that happened in a company, they got ambushed, uh, a platoon of a company, and they lost several dead and just about everybody in the platoon was wounded. And one of the guys, John Cologne, uh, he was shot up so bad they put him in a body bag, sent him back to our base camp, and put him with other body bags. And when our medical officer was going through checking tags, he thought this guy is alive. And Doc Lovey said, no, nah, my medics are too good. But he, Doc did go out, put his glasses under the man's nose. They fogged, and he's alive today. In fact, there's... Uh, you know, if you Google him, uh, you can find an interview with CBS News. And, you know, it's an interesting thing to talk to somebody that was given up for dead. And the only other case that I can think of is Roy Benavidez that was put in a body bag. Yeah, there's John right there. Guys, yeah. I'll link this uh, this into the uh, comments so y'all can check it out um, and, and see it. Um because he's got a pretty interesting story that uh would you like to say what uh what he did post vietnam since we're on the subject or on him he spent i think two years at letterman 
in uh, Colorado. And after he got out, he went, you know, I don't know his whole background as far as step by step, mm -hmm. but he ended up in Pinckney, Michigan, uh, which is, I don't know, it's a, it's a small town. And he opened up a Chrysler dealership. And the service areas were outside on the drive. It was just like a two-car garage with a showroom. And he built that into the largest Chrysler Plymouth dealership in Michigan. Wow. He, he served on several uh, civilian veterans boards. Uh, he's done some, uh, I don't want to call it lecturing, but, you know, appearances. Mm -hmm. And... He owns Hell, Michigan, and Hell, Michigan is a postage stamp little town. There's the dam side in because there's a small dam in the stream right there. There's Screams Ice Cream Parlor, uh, general store, and a post office like you see in a Western. And, you know, it, it's just a, a tourist thing. And, uh, yeah. And he uh, he makes up shirts. You know, the man is one hell of an entrepreneur. But getting back to uh, the military, uh, when the Desert Storm and all the you know the, all the fighting was going on, and we were getting a lot of wounded, at Walter Reed. Uh, I live in Northern Virginia, and. Uh, we would go visit the wounded at Walter Reed, especially the 101st guys. And John and I got into, we walked into one of the rooms and the soldier was kind of, you know, gimpy arm. And John started talking to him and was able to tell him how to get that uh, movement back how he did it to get the movement back. And he went to the grease pencil board that was on the wall. And he said, I used to do this, you know, and I was getting the coordination and the movement. And the guy got up and tried it. And uh, he had a smile on his face. You know, all the physical therapy and everything the VA was doing for him, or, the, you know, the military was doing for him. I'm not sliding that in their treatment or whatever, but somebody as determined as John Colon is, uh, you know, he made it work. And he's, you know, he's still a little crippled because of the bullet wounds, mm -hmm. but uh, a nicer guy you wouldn't meet, you can't meet. Wow. That's that. I mean, that's uh, that, that story uh, about, uh, Mr. John and, and him being in the body bag. I mean, I, and you mentioned Roy Benavidez after that. And I think we even brought it up that he even went a step further than Roy. I mean, they had taken him back and thrown him in with a stack of dead. He was getting ready to probably go to the mortuary. Uh, I mean, that that's terrifying and heavy duty and thank God y'all double check and someone saw it or, or saw the bag moving. <laughs> so, uh, after the Tet Offensive, uh, that took quite a while because there was residual fighting. Uh, we had we had cleared the city, and uh, th there was a lot of we couldn't use any heavy weapons because it was a sacred little whatever for Vietnamese. And finally, they allowed us to use our one hundred six. Uh, recoilless and uh, gunships and my Charlie company we had to cross the Kaite River on a bridge one of the old bridges with the steel girders that go up and over and whatever uh, under fire and the company commander at that time Doug Allitz he said we're going across and don't stop for anybody, including me. And we made the assault over the bridge. And you could hear bullets pinging on the uh, girders. 
and kicking up dust. But to the best of my recollection, we didn't have anybody wounded in that crossing. You know, God. it ain't your day. It ain't your day. And uh, so the, anyway, I continued on with the 506. And uh, uh, I have no regrets about that. On the 22nd during the uh, Tet Offensive, I got slightly wounded. Uh, didn't have to leave the field. But, uh, you know, the one of the medics patched it up. And uh, there I was. And towards the end of the tour, found out that if you volunteered for a second tour in Vietnam, you could pick your assignment. And I thought, okay, I'll volunteer to go back, but I want special forces. And I didn't know if I was going to get it or not, not, not having gone through, you know, brag and, you know, training group and everything. Mm-hmm. But I did make it to uh, this group. And, oh, by the way, on the way back over to Vietnam, Bob Howard and I, I met Bob Howard at uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And uh, sat. we sat next to each other on the long flight across the Pacific. And he, he was... I would say a typical Southern gentleman. And when I saw his left breast (laughs) uh, and and all the soldiers out there are going to know what I'm talking about. I was just flabbergasted. You know, I don't remember how many uh, uh, extra purple, the little Oak leaf or whatever on his purple heart, but he had multiple, you know, wounds, and I hope my dog's not making too much noise back there. It's fine. It, no, sir. She's fine. The, uh, uh, I got them both locked outside. <laughs> the, uh, uh, occasionally, I see the shepherd jumping up on the door. But uh, so anyway, get to uh, 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 Tonsonute, I think it was. Maybe it was Benoit, I'm not sure. And Bob went his separate way. And, you know, some REMF was telling everybody else they got to go this way. And, you know, check in, get your assignment. Well, I already knew where I was going. And I just said, uh, not this guy. He made my way to Nakrang. And uh, when I got there, the person, I don't know what rank they were, but they were kind of perplexed on what to do with me. (laughs) And, you know, again, not being gone through training group or anything. And then he said, you know, come to think of it, I got a job that would fit your background perfectly. And I said, what's that? And he said, I can't tell you. And I said, you can't tell me. He says, I can't tell you unless you sign a confidentiality, non-disclosure type thing and and swear an oath to secrecy. So I said, you know, what the hell? And I did it. And then he told me. And after a brief discussion, there was a pretty good sized book. And he said, pick out a code name. And so I went through the book and I saw Fandango. And being a Western buff and all that, you know, I thought, okay, I'll take that. And I was still uh, an FNG, if you will. And I said, what's the code name for? Well, if you get killed and they have to leave you behind, you know, they'll use that or, you know, whatever. And if uh, you're in trouble on the run, you know, that's a way to identify you. So anyway, after that, I think uh, I had a, a billet for maybe two nights. And the one day I was free, I went to the ice cream parlor they had there. <laughs> Very unusual. <laughs> 
And uh, then I went up to uh, Fubai. And upon arrival at Fubai, I got issued a Car 15, a few other little uh, toys, and uh, assigned a hooch. And that was it. Uh, and then again, the, the people there were a little perplexed because here's this guy, you know. And so they, they sent me on my first hatchet force uh, across the fence. And that was for a BDA and target MA-14. And that was pretty uneventful except for we came across a bunch of NBA swimming in a river down in this ravine. And myself and a couple of the other Americans crawled up there. And looking down, we saw those NBA. And I started to bring that car 15 up. And the NCOIC there said, no, 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 no. We're here to sneak around. This ain't the 101. <laughs> We're here to snoop and poop. <laughs> yeah. So that was a pretty uneventful hatchet force. Uh, I made another hatchet force across the fence, uneventful. And then I'm trying to think, it was, I want to say it was late November, early December, uh, where I took a, a bunch of the yards out to call it a shooting range off, off our little post, you know, uh, FOB there. And one of the yards hooked up a couple belts of 60 ammo and just held the trigger down. And didn't hurt anybody, but it misfired. And there was a round stuck in the chamber. He couldn't clear it. I went up there, and as I was looking down, it <sighs> and my whole this whole arm was just covered a lot of blood, but nothing deep. You know, it was like gunpowder and you know brass powder. powder. <sighs> and I started cussing like a. Uh, <laughs> I was friggin' livid, and I then I started laughing. Because one of the yards started laughing about me cussing. So we're all laughing. And then they come up and they bandage my arm for me. Wow. And uh, we're on our way back to the FOB. And then as we were approaching the gate, uh, got in. And there was my father. He was a major at the time with the 9th Infantry down at Canto. And he came up to visit. And we visited for a while, but he looked at that forearm that was uh, all bandaged up and blood. And I said, it ain't nothing. Don't worry about it, Pops. And off to the clinic, sat on a gurney, medic unwrapped it. I wish I remembered his name. Uh, he unwrapped it and looked at it and says, man. I can't dig all those out. I got an idea. So he gets a straight razor. And to my right arm, he's like he's shaving my arm. And that stuff, you know, he's peeling some skin. And when I flinched, he went like this. And I looked up and on the ceiling, there was a sign that said, smile, pain builds character. <laughs> Man, <laughs> uh, what, 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 now was this a uh, one of the the SOG docs here or uh, there on base at, at Fuba working yeah, on? Yeah, was a medic. Yeah. Wow, I've recently gotten in contact with one of the the later uh, SOG docs, and he was actually a doctor. Uh, and he's uh, he's he's got some good good medical tales, and uh, as they say, they're you're in no better hands when. There's a Green Beret medic around. You, uh, you, you know it, man. And uh, God bless the medics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whether they be a, a grunt medic 
or an SF medic True or a that. PJ, you know, they, uh, they saved a lot of lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to pull up. So, a photo. I'm trying to think it was probably two days before Christmas. Yeah, that's the uh, FOB. And uh, I, I don't know who one of the NCOs came and said, hey, Kropchak, they want to see you at the top. And so I went over to the headquarters unit and whoever, again, I'm terrible with names now. Uh, memory doesn't serve me well when it comes to names. Uh, and he said, we got a, a spike team, recon team going uh, in a day or so, and they're short a man. You you want to go? Again, I think he was asking if I wanted to go because I hadn't been through training. Mm -hmm. Well, by then, I had already gone through 1-0 school. Okay. So I did have some SOG training. And uh, I still got a scar on my... Uh, right pelvis from rappelling out of a helicopter at one zero school wow. and uh i got myself going too fast on the way down and when i belayed you know it uh it, it smarted a little <laughs> you know you live and learn um so anyway i said sure and got together with oddly mills who was the last SOG operator killed in, you know, in the war, and Bill Phillips. Mills was a 1-1, one, one, or 1-0. One, I was put in as a 1-2, or the <laughs> one, I'm sorry, I'm the assistant team leader. And then Phillips was the radio operator. Uh, and we were sent into MA-14 to tap the uh, telephone lines that on a previous uh, hatchet force mission, we had come across and it was just as far as you could see telephone poles and wire on it. And uh, so we went in with a recording device and, you know, got inserted without any problems. And uh, yeah, There's the, no. uh, we spent the night, you know, RON uh, off a trail, and we did the usual in and around, and then came back this way close to the trail. Uh, so, you you know, if somebody was tracking you, uh, before they got to you, you'd know it. And the next morning, we got up, ate a little bit of chow, Started down the ridge line, or finger, and got bushwhacked. And in the initial burst of fire, everyone was hit by gunfire except me. Wow. The, the man right behind me, the tail gunner, a yard, uh, I think it was a yard, uh, took one through the left lung. He was down and out. Uh, Mills uh, was hit by grenade fragments. Phillips had a big old gash in his, his he took a bullet in his arm. And our interpreter uh, got shot in the femur and his leg was broke. And, uh, you know, we're still under fire and Phillips was having a hard time because of his uh, gunshot wound. And I said, throw me the radio. So he threw it over to me, and I grabbed it. And about that time, because I was kind of kneeling, a slug hit me in the back. But I still had my rucksack on, and what, whatever was in there that stopped it, didn't I didn't, you know, get wounded, so to speak. But I got slammed down and broke my right wrist. <sighs> and... I didn't even know the wrist was broken until I got back, you know. Wow. That adrenaline. Well, there was, you know, I was a little busy at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, 
you know, we were in deep doo doo. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Covey said, you know, uh, I'll have assets on the way, you know, whatever he normally said. Again, my memory is really fuzzy. Um, And we got, uh, uh, I'm trying to say it was, I think it was a gunship. Or maybe it was, you know, one of the other air assets, but there was a couple of uh, NVA running down a trail, pointed them out to them, and uh, no, it was a cubby bird that did it. Uh, And he hit those guys running down the trail with a white phosphorus marking. Uh, Wow. So, (laughs) you know, we're engaged and helicopter, I could hear the Hueys. And the uh, uh, fast movers mm-hmm. and the, spat, the, the uh, A1E suspend. And to my humble opinion, that was the best ground support aircraft in the war, was those Sky Raiders. And uh, they started doing their thing, you know, around us. Oh, yeah. And then I hear on the radio, of all things, our call sign was dry rot. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be laying in the jungle, dry rot. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I hear dry rot, dry rot. This is Scarface, whatever, you know. And he was about overhead, and he says, if you can move about 25, 30 meters up that uh, finger, there's a spot I can get into. And I said, I can't move 30 feet. I got too many wounded, and pretty much I was the only one that could carry somebody. And uh, Phillips, he helped me uh, get the guy with a sucking chest wound. I had started an IV on him before the choppers got there of serum albunum, and just as I hung the bottle on a piece of bamboo or whatever, and got back to my fighting position, the IV bottle got hit. Mm. Dang. And so I pulled it out of him, and he every time he'd moan, we'd get more grenades. Or and I kind of knew better, but I gave him a shot of morphine, mm-hmm. and uh, it was either take the risk with him, or maybe get us overrun. Mm-hmm. And he did survive. And so anyway, Scarface is telling you know try to move. I told him, can't do it. And I said, if you got some balls and I'll do some chopping, you can get in here. Because I'd seen that done in, you know, with 101st. Oh, yeah. You know, there wasn't anything super big that was going to, you know, make him immobile. So he said, all right, here I come. And down he came like a friggin' lawnmower. <laughs> and uh, got everybody on board that Huey. And Phillips and I looked at each other because he came in with a medic. So he's already got pilot, Peter pilot, gunners, and a medic. Got five people on board. And we put five more on board and figured, that's it. We're going to have to stay till the next lift. And the crew chief's going, come on, come on. And uh, so we hopped on and uh, he started up and gained enough altitude where he could shoot down that finger and get some uh, airspeed and got us out of there. Man. So we ended up landing at Charlie Med and they rushed the second chest wound in and uh, the other wounded as the uh, Blades were shutting down. Crew chief looked up there and said, this bird ain't going anywhere. And, you know, because of the damage. And I just happened to look into that. uh, It was like a mash unit into that tent. And I saw. For all intents and purposes, probably a well-meaning guy. 
but uh, somebody on the medical staff there was walking up to the wounded with a camera. And I got livid. And I went in there and uh, made them understand that that was not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so from there, Philip I, Mills, uh, got flown back to uh, Bubai and debriefed. And uh, their you know, wounds were treated more, you know, more thoroughly there. And uh, they sent me to uh, uh, Way. There's a hospital there. So, you know, it was a naval hospital, I think. <laughs> And uh, for my wrist, and x ray set it, and back, back to Fubai. And that was late December, right around the change of the year, because I think it was the 28th. It was the 28th when we got bushwhacked. And Fubai was being shut, was going to, was shutting down. And uh, I had to make another trip to the Naval Hospital because my wrist was going numb. They reset it, casted it, back to Fubai. And as it was shutting down, Lynn Black and I were two of the last ones there. And we loaded up a quarter ton trailer with ammo and explosives you know, to take down to the name. And we're in one of the, uh, shall I say, infamous saga Jeeps with no markings. And uh, we started out for Da Nang and we had a bottle of Jack, I think, <laughs> and a bunch of cold beer. And we're drinking crazy people. And it was nighttime and we're going up the High Von Pass. And all of a sudden, we got lit up by lights, not gunfire. It was a marine roadblock. And this butter bar marine lieutenant was not real happy with us. <laughs> you know, what the hell are you guys doing? Can't tell you. You know, what unit are you with? Can't tell you. <laughs> and, and Lynn was just. If I wasn't live here, I'd, I'd say what he said, but uh, basically uh, just kept messing with him. Oh, yeah. And while all this is going on, I got out of the Jeep and pissed right there. <laughs> anyway, the lieutenant finally gave up and said, you guys aren't going any further. And we said, okay. And we spent the night there, went on our way the next morning, uneventful. And uh, uh, when we got there, uh, I don't remember who it was or whatever. And they said, where have you guys been? You know, <laughs> you know, we said, why? Well, we we're about to put you down as missing. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> to that effect, you know, <laughs> I thought, oh shit. That's just what my mother needs with her it's husband and her son. In the at the same time, you know, oh. um, and that's pretty much it. And we got to Da Nang. And uh, I spent the next couple of months with a cast on my arm, healing. And that's the end of my adventure. Uh, I know one night that uh, 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 I'm having... Uh, I'll think of it. Uh, he lived in Indiana, and we were pretty good friends. He and I were on the mortar pit one night. It was our, our round around, you know, to do it. And the guys up on the mountain called for illumination. And uh, we were drinking a few beers in the mortar pit. <laughs> and chill, oh, shoulders, rich shoulders. Oh, yes. And 
I grabbed an illumination round and shoulders, you know, we dropped it, it went off, but it didn't, it didn't illuminate and dropped another one in. It went off. Okay. I told you that's bad for your health. <laughs> I tried to do that without you seeing me. The, uh, Probably maybe 20, 30 minutes after we dropped that first uh, round, there was movement. And what it was, it was the Vietnamese family from the village that was there. Their young daughter had her legs taken off by that dud round. Mm. And, you know, that's just the fortune of the war but uh it it lingers you know because it was a kid and i think of that often i i i mean I, I, we've heard of not um, some stories like that but uh, you you have to keep uh, like y'all said i mean you you had no idea you know that could have been sappers coming in like in august and god forbid that they come in and you know like that uh, on y'all again uh, the uh i think the only other if you will call it adventure i had was i was uh in charge of the guards in the, in the towers and there were indig you know guard up there and when i got to the corner up by the south china sea here comes one of those little round boats the guys paddling right towards our perimeter and I thought, uh-uh, you know, and I, I capped the guy mm. and I got called on the carpet for it. And why'd you shoot him? And I said, I thought he might have explosives. He was coming into basically like a no fly zone. And, uh, <laughs> uh, he Restricted said, area. Yeah. well, you should have called for a swift boat or a patrol boat or whatever, uh, had them handle it. And, but you did what you did. And, uh, yeah, right, right there. And, uh, that was the end of it. So come the end of, uh, April, there was five of us going home. Driscoll, uh, Estes, Davidson, myself, and I can't remember who the fifth, the fifth was. So we get on a plane, we're in full dress uniform, and get off, we're flown into Seattle, and uh, go to Fort Lewis, and then we headed to town. We get into St. Louis or uh, Seattle, and drinking pretty heavily. Hmm. We into this bar, sat at a table big enough for five guys, and we're sitting there minding our own business. And it was kind of like a college crowd, you know, that age bracket, uh, mid twenties, things like that. And there was uh, a table with a bu bunch of uh, pretty nice looking girls and just a couple of guys. And one of the guys got up and started walking towards us. Mm -hmm. so, uh oh, this is going to be one of those you baby killers or something. And uh, so we were not ready for what just happened. And he said, you guys just back from the war? And we said, yeah. And he says, well, We'd like to invite you over to our table. Oh, wow. You know, here we're expecting, you know. The worst. And, so we went over with them. They bought us a few drinks. And uh, we got pretty lit up. <laughs> and I think it was uh, Davison, who lived in New Orleans. He had a flight that night. So uh, he, he left. And uh, took a cab back. And the last thing I remember from that night 
was showing the cab driver the key to the hotel. <laughs> and we got there, back to the hotel, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up on the floor uh, with a hell of a hangover and oh, thinking, yeah. oh, shit. You know, I had about probably five, six hundred bucks in cash. Oh. And the separation check, you know, it was almost two grand. Uh, and I I had all my money. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. You know, had my watch. And from there, we said, Arrivederci. And we all went our separate ways. And then. Uh, children, are that, Childers and I got together over the years because we lived in Indiana at the time. So did he. And uh, unfortunately, he died in a uh, real bad car accident. And uh, but the wife and I went to Vegas one one year, and I gave Driscoll a call, and he took us, you know, invited us over to his house. And he came to the bar, and uh, we had one drink. And I was, I said, why the hell are they giving me change in silver dollars? You know, because I'm not a gambler or anything. And I said, that's because they want you to put them in a the slot machine. So anyway, we left there and followed him to his house. And a uh, nice little house. A very small backyard, which is typical. And he had his first patch of decent grass. And he was so proud of that grass. You know, because there ain't a lot of grass in Vegas. Oh, yeah. None so, at all. <laughs> again, the wife and I, you know, we, we uh, stayed there. Said our goodbyes in the morning. And the wife and I took off. And that was uh, pretty much it. Uh, I'm trying to think. I got active in the 101st Airborne Association mm -hmm. and in fact became a national officer with them for a while. And uh, that piqued my interest. And then the award of the, you know, PUC uh, at Bragg. Mm -hmm. And the wife and I flew out there got a rental car, checked into the hotel. Yeah, here's my buddy Tilt. And Tilt, I don't remember how we crossed paths, but we saw each other. And he didn't have wheels. So the wife and I chauffeured him, you know, to different locations to see things. And, uh, uh, you know, went on with the reunion, and I was talking to Tilt, and I think Spider was standing there, and I said, you know, one of the things I, I can't remember is who in the hell I was in that Jeep with closing out Fubai, and Lynn just happened to be standing there, <laughs> and he says, my crop deck, meet Lynn Black, <laughs> and, you know, then it all kind of clicked, and, uh, Lynn and I keep in touch, you know, a few phone calls now and then, you know, not as much as uh, probably some of the other guys, but, and then Tilt and I, and uh, I got, Tilt got me involved in the Special Operations Association mm -hmm. and became a life member of that. And I'm also a member of the SF Association. Uh, 101st Association in various veterans groups. And that's about it for my history, you know, as far as military. And after the military, I went into law enforcement, spent 30 years there uh, with the part-time work that I did for them and then the uh, full-time work. I did everything from uniform patrol to a U.S. Marshal Fugitive Task Force. Man. Most jobs in between worked undercover narcotics, and uh, trying to think, two kids <laughs> they went to IU, Indiana University, got four year degrees, and our son's a Washington D.C. policeman, a 
22 years, I think. And that's a combat zone. Oh, yeah. And, you ain't lying. Uh, our daughter's a, uh, I think, the number two person in the Roanoke, the Western District of Virginia uh, federal probation. So Man. she's basically in law, enfor uh, law enforcement. Federal to uh, the yeah. university cop. Wow. The only one that isn't involved is my daughter in law, who is a special ed teacher here in uh, Berkeleyville. A family of service right there. That that's one thing you can say. That that y'all are a family of service, by God. The oh. uh, the wife and I were fortunate enough to be able we were able to travel. Uh, unfortunately, it's getting a little more difficult. The wife's a three time cancer survivor. My God. Uh, and she's pretty damn healthy for, you know, thank goodness, 75 years old. And uh, sorry, Donna. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we traveled a lot. We used to go from uh, uh, mid February to mid March to Hawaii. And stay with friends at the Halicoa, which is a military MWR site. And we have one of our KIAs buried there, and we'd always go and put flowers. And, uh, uh, but we haven't done that. Gone to Normandy several times uh, for the uh, D Day celebrations. Oh, and that's amazing. Have a very good friend that I met on my first official trip to Normandy, who uh, was a, is a reenactor. Oh. And there are, if you've never been there, there are reenactors and then there's reenactors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The group that I bumped into by chance were true reenactors. There were no Colonel or major winners. There were no, you know, Bill Garnier and aid tags or anything like that. The group that I happen to fall in with, uh, they only wear uh, the campaign ribbons, you know, the non-combat related stuff. They don't wear CIBs, uh, and they really go out of their way uh, to represent American paratroopers, especially the 501st, because that's their kind of adopted uh, regiment. And uh, on my first trip, officially for the 101st, I had a few places I had to go to for commemoration. Mm -hmm. And the first place I went to, it was a trooper that had died in the backyard of this family house. And they didn't know it until they got up in the morning and his body was laying there. And they got this plaque and, you know, they put a small memorial in there and I gave a short talk and after the official stuff was over, local children gave me, gave me a rose. They gave other roses out, but I got one. And I asked the owner of the property, I said, where did they find that soldier? And they walked me over by this big tree and said he was laying right here. Mm -hmm. And I got down, knelt down, and I was going to plant that rose, mm -hmm. you know, right there. And the ground was, it was hard, you know, and I'm trying to scrape it away. And the reenactor color guard was within about two feet of me, you know, lined up. And the next thing I know, I got a bayonet in my hand. You know, one of them pulled that bayonet out, giving it to me, made a hole, put that rose in there, covered it up, stood up, saluted him, and it was over. So after the uh, ceremony was over, I walked over to these reenactors, and they spoke perfect English, uh, and became friends with a lot of them. And the... Uh, uh, they took me to a place that we call it the Pink Palace, and it's it's on the, the road to Carentan, and they serve a meal there, a lot of different kinds of meals, but they serve a steak dinner 
on a uh, it's almost like a cutting board but yay <laughs> wide or long and probably 14 inches wide oh. and it's got this huge hunk of beef on it it's got uh it, mashed potatoes and i mean the platter is full of food and so anyway that trip's over with made a couple more and uh i think it was 219 yeah, i was 219 the wife and i took the uh kids and all four grandkids over for the dj celebration and they're all interested in history but one of those dutch friends of mine has a and b right near utah beach in <sighs> Angerville, Alpine, plain and that's the church of the bloody pew if you oh, that yeah. uh, I got some pictures of it they're still haunting you know the pews are just really blood stained and that's <sighs> because of the you know the medic set up shop in there and <sighs> powerful but I was fortunate enough mostly because of being a governor for the 101st I've had met Dick winners and uh, a bunch of us veterans were making a jump at Chambersburg, uh, Pennsylvania, and Winters was there. And afterwards, we were getting something to eat. And I walked over and I asked, sir, you know, can I have a picture with you? And he said, certainly. So somebody took a picture for me. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you guys were a tough act to follow. And he leaned over to me and he said, I followed you guys in Vietnam and you did a hell of a job and coming from him. I mean, that was, Oh yeah. That's uh, and, uh, uh, met Garnier and had lunch with him and a couple beers. <laughs> and that was probably 12 years ago or maybe a little more. And at that time, Garnier, I swear would still be a force to be reckoned with in a bar fight. He was such a feisty guy, even at his age and on a crutch. That's amazing. I I, I love hearing that. I, I can't I, when that show or the series comes on at any time. I have to stop what I'm doing and immediately watch. I, I it's become well that good. You know, I know this is supposed to be about Sog, and I'm kind of babbling about the hundred and first. No, that's fine, sir. But you know, on the ground in Vietnam with a rifle company. It's a lot different than going across the fence with a few people. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, we ended up with a valorous unit award for Tet for retaking the Fanciette city. And uh, uh, the uh, there's an English author Ian Gardner, who wrote a couple of books, several books, but on the 506 in World War II. And he got the idea. He wanted to do something uh, about the 3rd Battalion. And he talked to uh, Colonel Fink's daughter about the... Uh, uh, his idea, it's one in the middle. Oh, that's Gardner. That's all his books. Um, uh, and Robin told him to get hold of me. So get the call from England. And uh, I became his gopher. Because I could contact all the guys. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I contacted him and said what was going on. And do I have permission to give the author your name? And getting to the getting back to trying to expedite this a little for you. Uh, Garner interviewed, I think, 40 people. And the book, Sign Here for Sacrifice, is about strictly about the 3rd Battalion and the first year uh, of, the, uh, of our training and deployment. And it's nonfiction. It's all true, uh, based on our veterans' accounts. You know, 
Uh, somebody might say it was uh, cloudy and somebody might say it was clear, but those would be the only kind of differences. You know, you're not different war stories from different people. Did you lose me? No, I've, I've got you here. I'm you look kind of <laughs> out of touch there for a minute. Trying yeah. to pull up the uh, so people can see. And what Carter did after the book was over, and this is one book that flows. You know, you don't want to put it down. Mm -hmm. And at the end, for everybody that was mentioned and interviewed for that book, he has a short bio post-Vietnam such as uh, I got married, wife of Donna, lived in Indiana, uh, moved to Virginia, two children, four grandchildren, uh, worked as a law enforcement guy. And that's pretty much it. He was trying to show that not every Vietnam vet, you know, was this long-haired, bearded, hippie, dope-smoking, anti-war person. And... I really think the vast majority during the Vietnam era, veterans are proud of their service and uh, very few, you know, when you can look at the statistics, I think, uh, and I think a lot of those that were protesting, uh, yeah, remember that day, kind of a proud day. Oh, yeah. um, Jump I think a lot of them have uh, seen the light. You know, as you're, you know, you got more behind you than in front of you. Uh, trivial doesn't matter, but you know, there is uh, no greater sport in this world than hunting man. You know, I'll ask. You know, if somebody's doubting something or other, I'll say, you a hunter? And if they say, yeah, and I says, well, let me give you an example. How would you feel if the bunny rabbit or Bambi had a rifle and could shoot back? Now, that, that would be sport. Oh, yeah. That's why I mentioned, you know. That. And um, it's just the memories, you know, you you don't make friends uh, like you do in combat. You know, I'm not put. I don't care if a guy was a cook in Germany during the war, he did his job for the country. But for us, who were up close and personal, uh, there's a bond there that next to your children. In your your own wow. personal family, they're your family. And you know another thing, I've been able to expound on to college kids, high school kids. You know, all our kids were involved in sports, and I I would tell them, there's a bright side to everything. You know, don't feel sorry. You know, because something didn't happen or whatever. Uh, you know, just keep your chin up. And if you really feel like you're suffering, I said, go sit in the lobby of a VA hospital. Absolutely. And just observe and see what cost has been paid for you to bitch about some trivial, you don't like, mm -hmm. you know, and I would also occasionally, if the time was right, say, I used to think, and I think some of the other guys did, because I heard it from one of them, they could kill me, but they couldn't eat me. That's against the rules. We've heard that that one, uh, and I'm still trying to think of who said that, but uh, we, we've heard that from one other veteran that, that, that said that exact thing. They can't eat us. They can do whatever else they want, but they can't eat us. The... Uh, other than that, in the reunions, seeing the guys, uh, whether it be SOA or 101st, and uh, every 19th, February 19th, my 506, uh, 
we call them boat people that went over on a boat. Mm -hmm. We're really tight. Wow. We we go to the wall in DC and have we stay around panel 46, 48, because that's where a lot of our KIAs are listed. Mm -hmm. To pay our respects to them and the reason for the 19th, that's when John Cologne, his platoon got all shot up. And there were a bunch of KIAs that day. So we go there, commemorate, think of them, talk to passers-by, and uh, every Memorial Day, we send flowers to the grave sites. Yeah, that's a grave uh, headstone in Arlington of my uh, the battalion commander that formed the 3rd Battalion. He was the bulldog. Uh, wow. He, uh, Every WW Memorial Day. Korea and Vietnam. Good Lord, have mercy. Uh, he, uh, we send flowers to every gravesite of our KIAs. And to our knowledge, we are the only uh, veterans group that there's a lot of memorials, you know, where they get around one memorial and things like that. And I'm not knocking that, but what we do with those flowers, you'd be amazed that some people still contact us because we put a little card on there that we, that we remember their father, you know, their husband. And, uh, it is, uh, emotional medicine for us. You know, PTSD takes a lot out of you. But being able to help people oh, yeah. and let people know there are some good people in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I can't think of much other than to babble if you got any questions. <laughs> yep, uh, we we do have a, a few. That's uh, a, an amazing, an amazing history uh, in, in life you've you've lived, sir. Uh, I mean, absolutely, uh, just, just outstanding. We're always in store for, for a heck of a, a story like that. When, when we have one of you gentlemen on and, and, uh, we, we always thank our vets for y'all service to this country. And for, for us as the son of a Marine Corps veteran combat vet, uh, I always try and, uh, do what I can for, for our Vietnam vets, especially here locally, we've got a, a few things we've got going on and being so close to Fort Rucker. So um, the, uh, I did think of one thing about mm -hmm. sock. Yes, sir. Bill Phillips, who was the radio operator on that team, uh, probably better 20 years ago. I get a call from Steve Sherman mm -hmm. and Sherman said, uh, there's a lady trying to get hold of you. And, he sent me her information because he will not give out contact information for us up people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I called her and she was the uh, girlfriend uh, and really tight with Bill Phillips. And she said he was having a hard time and he wants to go to the reunion, but he can't suck it up and go. So I told her, fine, I'll talk to him. You know, well, you know, I'll go with him. And so the two of us went to uh, the plaza, spent the uh, reunion there. Uh, he and I talked a lot. We shared some things together and uh, his girlfriend was there taking pictures and it, uh, it helped him and uh, I lost contact with him. I understand he passed some years back, uh, but you know, again, things will pop into my mind and say, you know, it would, to give some other people credit, you know, uh, this is not about credit for anybody. It's just about history. I, uh, I've got an interview that I'm, tr 
trying to find oh there it is right there i'm going to share it that uh i believe i sent to you when we first started talking that was on youtube of uh mr bill talking about his service which uh is pretty pretty extensive his his self before he was injured and went back home but uh he's quite the guy as well yeah he uh <clears throat> i was kind of moved that at the very end of that interview when you asked him about keeping in touch and he said, the only one I keep in touch with, I don't remember his exact words, were myself. Mm -hmm. You know, he mentioned me by name and uh, I thought, yeah, you know, that's a true friend and oh, brother. Yeah. Wow. That's it, it, it. And we've had a, a few guys that have linked up that have seen each other since Vietnam, but they don't see each other quite often. They do keep in touch by phone and it's just amazing seeing them pick up like it's not been 50 some odd years since y'all, you know, it, it's just wild to see. It's like no time's passed at all. Yeah. To see those, if you, it's been the 50 years to see what used to be a lean green fighting machine <laughs> with their, you know, beer bellies and, <laughs> You know, the health issues. And on that note, I'd like to say from my personal experience and only my personal experience, the VA has taken extraordinary care of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of Agent Orange issues and, you know, got replacement knees that at first weren't service connected, but uh, yeah. <laughs> the VA bureaucrats, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, medical people, I've had really good luck. So, oh yeah, and That's been involved in Chicago VA, Salem, Virginia, uh, uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, Honolulu. Oh yeah, and in each one of those places, I've gotten excellent care. I'm glad to hear that because every now and again you, you, we get the story uh, of something happening at the VA or someone's saying bad stuff's going on but we've had as a matter of fact i think our past two uh interviews we've had uh the veterans have said they uh they owe a lot to the va because they they've uh not only them suffering with agent orange but pts uh with one of our guests and he said they've done miraculous work for him uh, well that that appointment i told you might cause me to be late today uh <laughs> The VA sent me to an outside doctor from ear, nose, and throat. Oh, okay. uh, I have I've had chronic sinus problems, and uh, my hearing's bad enough. Uh, but the sinus is causing pressure, you know, and things like that. So they're going to take care of me on the outside. Uh, I, they've sent me if if they can't get you in, in thirty days, care in the community, you know right away they'll schedule you out there wow so anyway again i feel like i'm babbling no 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 not at all um we uh we actually do have a few questions and again um some of them are are asking or fewer for names and all that and if you know if you it's been 50 years if you don't remember by all means it, it's fine uh but Let's see. Jason is in reading Tilt's John Myers book. He described how sad his team was to leave FOB1 for FOB4 when it became CCN. He mentions a saying, Fubai is all right. What did you think of Fubai and why do you think everyone enjoyed it there? Well, Fubai was, uh, an, you know, for FOB, and it wasn't a large campus, if you will you know, to use civilian terms, um, tight knit group, you know, uh, pretty much, uh, if you weren't doing something like going out on a mission training, things like that, there are times you can feel like I'm not really in the army. You know, you go to the club, uh, Tony Harrell tilt, playing liar's dice, you know, uh, it's just like the medic I told you about earlier, you know, look up on the ceiling and see a sign like that. It was like just a big family there. And, uh, 
Willoughby and I, we used to climb up the rappelling tower and sit up there and just talk, you know, and look. And I mean, the view is great from up there, you know, and uh, that's hilarious. You know, that's one of the things I remember. I remember uh, uh, the only we watched, uh, uh, I think it was Bad Day at Black Rock, Spencer Tracy Western. And that's the only movie we had for a couple of weeks. So we watched that same movie over and over again, you know, and again family that that's uh in reading hearing listening to you guys talk and all of that that that's the best way to describe it is a a big family with a, a bunch of brothers and and one dad or maybe a dad and a few uncles with the officers trying to overlook y'all but one well, big thing <laughs> when uh going back a little bit i was uh uh, when I was a law enforcement guy, Tony Harrell, God rest his soul, had this little convenience like store up in, uh, uh, I'm having a brain fart, in Michigan. And anytime I drove up to Detroit to extradite a prisoner or something like that, I'd stop at Tony's place. And, you know, uh, we'd talk for a little bit and then I'd be on my way, you know, and, uh, you know, that's one of the things that meant a lot. And, you know, I didn't run with a lot of these men, you know, I'm just, uh, I don't, I don't rise to the occasion of guys like Tilt, Lynn, you know, so many of the others. You know, I was just a small little pebble on the beach. And, but I'm very proud of that. Absolutely uh, should be. Absolutely. Uh, and the fact that, you know, Lynn and I, we email back and forth now and then. Uh, oh, that's the story you want me to tell. I remember from yesterday about Lynn Black going into a pub in Washington State. Now, this is a hoot. You know, anyway, Lynn had a uh, SF cap on and he went into this little pub that caters mostly to veterans and what have you. And a young guy, or well, our age type guy comes up to him and he says, you know, you were special forces. Yeah. And he says, well, my only encounter the only time I ever made special forces guys was in the middle of the night on the high Vaughn pass <laughs> <laughs> at a roadblock. And, and Lynn said, hold that thought. He went out, got his book, said, read the last chapter. And the guy, you know, got done, looked up at him and he said, obviously one of them's me and the other ones he's alive in Indiana. And, but what are the odds, you know, of maybe 30 years or 25 years, whatever, post Vietnam, going into a little bar in Washington state and having an experience like that? It, it, it's literally, I, I, it, it's uncalculable. We were trying to think it's, it's even bigger than, you know, the, the, the lottery odds. It, it's just fate that i mean it was meant for them to bump into each other that day i think so you got, you got more questions <laughs> oh yes sir we've we've got a few more um hey don't call me sir i work for 11. i you gotta <laughs> you gotta forgive me that's that uh so, southern hospitality slipping through where i i'm still still doing that and every guest tells me don't don't call me sir please it's just a habit um uh kyle is curious did you ever serve uh or support the base firebase ripcord no. no i had nothing to do with ripcord i know a lot of the veterans that did you know from my 101st association but no uh that was one hell of a fight at uh <laughs> 
that's 101st, uh, the grunt units, and of course the the LARP units uh, that that 68, 69. They are it, it's wild reading what the, what the, y'all were getting up to up there in I Corps. Uh, a lot of lot of hard fighting, a lot. Um, Oh, that was about the body bags. He's like, yeah, they're not very gentle with body bags, are they? Like, no, not when they think you're dead. They're going ahead and moving you. Um, oh, great question. Did you have dogs serving with you uh, in the 101st military work, dog? Um, as I recall, we went out with uh, a dog and a handler, Charlie Company anyway, just a couple of times. And uh, I'm not, you know, selling them short. Those dog handlers, they did a good job. And, uh, but they had one thing going for them that we didn't, the regular grunt. If there was something wrong with that dog, all they had to do is call and they got a taxi out of there, you know? And there's a lot of us that wish we had that before, <laughs> you know? Instead of y'all's get out of free jail card and SOG, that's a head back to the house out of the bush card with having the dog with you at that point. I, I remember one of them that was good size shepherd. Mm -hmm. And I'm a dog lover. I've had you know, always had shepherds and raw others. Uh, basically, paranoid, guarding the house. Uh, and I said, I started to move a little bit like I was going to pet him. And he said, don't pet him. He'll bite you. And he said he mauled, the dog mauled, uh, bit Kong or NVA, I don't remember. And, you know, he's tasted blood. Oh, so, wow. Okay, then. Yeah. That's... I've and I, I that's one thing you know I we see the guys in the desert and and nowadays how fiercely trained and interwoven and connected the handlers are with the dogs and and speaking with uh you you all of you Vietnam vets because most of the units at least had some experience with military dogs you guys up in I Corps though I I, I love I, as as well as me I'm a big dog lover rescue them. Uh, I, I can't imagine having a German shepherd out in that humidity and in the jungles. And I, I, seems like a good idea at first until you actually do it and having to supply the water and that's tough. Yeah. The, uh, but they did it. Oh yeah. They, they did it. And, and many of them did it quite well. Uh, but I, I was thinking about that the other day. That's, that's pretty, pretty tough stuff right there. Um, yeah, people asking about Bob Howard. Um, curious when uh, was this? When he was getting, had he gotten his Distinguished Service Cross at this time, or his Medal of Honor, or was no? He didn't have his Medal of Honor. Okay, he had Silver Star oh, yeah. with Oak Leaf. Uh, he may have had the DFC. I'm not sure. Uh, it but, was right around that time, either about to get it or had just gotten. He was uh, just going back there. I don't know if he, what he's back in uh, the States for, whether it was. Uh, Could have been one of, going one of back those. Another tour, you know, I, I have no clue. Could have been one of those nine purple hearts that he racked up. The, uh, uh, let's see. Do, uh, one zero school. uh and I'd forgotten you mentioned one zero school. Um, do you happen to remember any of the men or any of the instructors that, that stuck out uh, while you were in school? No, I'm terrible with names. Faces, I can pretty well remember. My wife gets irritated with me. <laughs> Who's that look like? You know, when I see somebody. Because if if the this part of the face matches or something, mm -hmm. you know, that trips my trigger about uh somebody i know but uh no i had nothing to do i can't say much about uh one zero school except that scar i got here from rappelling out of that helicopter <laughs> i mean that that's a that's a serious place when you know to to pass the course y'all are going out for that live fire exercise that's pretty heavy duty stuff right there that's real schooling yeah <laughs> um 
Jason was wondering, uh, was Mr. Spider running recon at this time, or was he already flying Covey? Uh, flying Covey. He's a great guy, too. I, I, God rest his soul. Uh, I, I was about to say he's one of – he was – out of everybody we hear about, he and Pat Watkins, if those two were in there, you felt safe on the ground is what we've gathered from the, the guys during that time. You know, when when you're on the ground, the uh, when you hear Spider's voice and the shit's hitting the fan, uh, it's comforting. Because you know he's going to do everything humanly possible to get you out alive. I, I, you, we read it in the books and we hear y'all talk about it. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it, it must feel good. But, I mean, it literally can be the difference between y'all right. life and death. You, you worrying yourself, making a bad move and causing somebody's death i mean it it made all the difference having a, a quality covey rider up there directing traffic so to speak mm -hmm. mm, i get the bubble guts just thinking about it um can you talk about the first time you got on a king bee we've heard it's been pretty wild uh with guys being a used to american pilots <laughs> believe it or not i never i have never ridden in a king bee wow okay <laughs> So you didn't get that roller co coaster ride? Nope. <laughs> That's crazy. But th we had some amazing king bee pilots. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Gosh, yes. Uh, and thank goodness Tilts had them uh, go sit with, uh, uh, God, uh, Jocko Wilnick, the, the Navy SEAL, and his mm -hmm. podcast to document some of their stories. Uh, just amazing men. Absolutely amazing men. Um. This one comes up. Uh, I was hoping it would. Yep, I forgot you said Mr. Art Driscoll earlier. We've been seeing his name a lot. Um, do you have any memorable encounters with wildlife or insects, either with the 101st or with Sog, that you can that sticks out? Can I get a little R-rated? You can. <laughs> you can. Funny story. Mm -hmm. The wife and I, the kids. We're at the National Zoo in Washington. And we're going through uh, the nocturnal building. Where the, uh, and I'm a little bit ahead of the family. And as I went around this little curve, bending uh, in that area, I looked up and I said, it's a fuck you lizard. <laughs> I said, Donna, Donna, they got a fuck you lizard. Because I told her, you know, about those damn things. And uh, she was so embarrassed because I didn't realize there was a family nearby. <laughs> you know, it's like, let me get away from this. <laughs> Don't pay attention to the man, honey. Don't pay attention to him. <laughs> uh, no, one of our guys in the 101st, I don't remember who it was. Uh, had an encounter with a tiger. Ooh. In fact, I got a picture of that somewhere. Um, Viet in, in the mosquitoes were horrible, you know, and the leeches. Mm -hmm. You know, there there were places where you stuck your foot, in, you know, one foot into some kind of water, uh, and you pull your foot out, and you got a dozen leeches on you you know in some places you had to put like a t-shirt over your canteen when you were filling it to keep the mosquito larvae and everything out of it gosh but as far as any uh uh the uh um, monkeys in laos oh yeah uh, <laughs> and 101st uh, it wasn't too bad when we were in the flatlands and the rice paddies and whatever. Uh, but if there was a lot of moisture, the mosquitoes, I mean, they were like B-52s. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it's a wonder. I know they gave you all the shots and everything, and y'all had y'all's uh, 
Is it yeah. Halzone tablets and stuff? I still can't. I can't believe more of y'all didn't get uh, malaria and you know black water fever and all of that stuff uh, from from the water and the mosquitoes and stuff. I, it, it's just a bad, bad, bad place. <laughs> well, also your drinking water may have been sprayed with Agent Orange. That too. That too. Oh yeah, it and, and it, I cringed the other day. I saw a photo of uh, a group of grunt marines uh, somewhere in uh, Tucor, uh, and they're at a, a bomb crater and filling up their things. And I said, "God Almighty, can you just imagine what there? There's probably a that's probably all Agent Orange residue and all of that. that they're just getting ready to to drink up and not even know what's coming years later. That's Probably how my dad ended up getting his Agent Orange. I'm, I'm sure probably getting sprayed on. I have no idea. That's a bone of contention with me. Um, uh, do you remember uh, any of the men that you, when you first got in SOG, that you learned the most from or that you looked to to, uh, to follow their example? No. You stay out there. Um. From the 101st, uh, the, in fact, I'm still, we don't live too far apart, the captain of Charlotte Company, and uh, he and I keep in touch, you know, we visit now and then, have coffee, uh, Nick Nahas, he was a great man, he still is, uh, for, for example, you know, RTOs, uh, are humping that radio, one on the company frequency, one on the battalion net, and you're constantly pulling shifts through the night monitoring the radios. Well, one particular day, we humped all day up this mountain, had set up a night perimeter, and the CNC ship went overhead, and it was uh, Jurassic. And he was chastising Nick, the company commander. You're not where I want you. You're supposed to be on that mountain over there. And he basically said, get off your ass and get moving. And Nick tried, but, you know, because, I mean, it's, it's getting dark. And so, anyway, down we go, up we go, get set up. And uh, needless to say, everybody's beat, you know, and set up to long and first, you know, and Nick said, you guys get some rest. I'll take the radios. And for a company commander to do that, you know, that's and let, let us get some rest, you know, a, a decent night's sleep Wow. and come probably just a little bit before daybreak, I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I joke with him still about that. He said, I don't remember that. <laughs> you couldn't. You were asleep. <laughs> but that, that, that's and great. Then, uh, there was a particular sergeant uh, who was similar but not as extreme as Sobel in mm. the series mm. and just just like Sobel and it was like just wait you'll get your paybacks you know and a lot of guys have thought about it and some of them have done it but that wasn't in me but anyway after my first firefight uh I would have kissed his ass. You know? uh, <laughs> Just you know, like all of them said in the series about Sobel. They yeah. wouldn't have made it probably if he hadn't have kicked their their asses up and down Cure. You know, I'd I, that it's wild that that thinking you think it's like, God, I'd love to just rip this guy's head off and, and just show tear him a new one. And then after you like you just said, you've been in it, it's I could kiss the ground things, he walked on. As far as that question goes. Uh, since we were all volunteers pretty much in that battalion, 
uh, we spent a lot of time training together in the States, just like Easy Company. And there were a lot of other companies in World War II that were just like Easy Company. It's just that, you know, they got picked, you know. And uh, so, I can't, you know, to really to uh, name somebody, one of the people I'll give a lot of credit to was our battalion surgeon, Andrew Lovey. L-O-V-Y, he was the first D.O. in the Army, not an M.D., osteopath. He, you know, they have the same skills as an M.D., but the M.D.s look down on them. And he was Jewish of small stature. So in the 60s, he had a lot of things going against him. Mm-hmm. But Jirasi... Uh, I don't remember the story, but somehow Drossi specifically asked for him, oh. you know, uh, wow. whether he had crossed paths, treated him or whatever. I don't know. But Andy, uh, he saved a lot of guys. Uh, and during the millennium, uh, 2000, we had a reunion down at Fort Campbell and a bunch of us went to Paris, Tennessee to make a civilian jump. Oh. And uh, so anyway, we make the drop. And uh, on the a, on a, uh, tarmac, guy comes running up, drops his drawers, <sighs> and his drawers, out in, the, out in the middle of just about everybody, and said, Doc, because he saw the doc. He says, Doc, Doc, look. I still got it. <laughs> Something to that effect. <laughs> and what had happened is the guy got it in the groin. And Doc packed his nuts, you know, inside, you know, and did whatever he did to try to save his, yeah. And uh, that was kind of funny. You know? Wow. But Andy... Uh, also, he was treating a wounded guy and he ran out of uh, hem sets and he used a dirty boot lace to tie off this one, you know, spot. And somebody said to him, Hey, that's going to cause an infection. And he says, An infection I can cure, death I can't, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of doc he was. And post Vietnam, uh, we, we he comes to the reunions. He's he teaches or he used to teach medical school. His health is failing him. But uh, I'll give you an example. He was an uh, ortho uh, eye doctor uh, before he became a doctor. And uh, when my son applied for DC, they told him. Uh, they couldn't hire him because he's colorblind. Oh, wow. And he says, I, man, I can see colors. He was still, you know, uh, and he was at home uh, because it was a delayed uh, procedure. And they told him, well, if you can get a doctor to say, you know, you're fine. And so I called Andy and uh, I told him, and he said, part of the problem is the way they present those little discs with all the dots, you know, and the numbers in them. And uh, so he gave our son some tips on, he, he sent him to a, a, a eye specialist uh, and he took care of my son gratis, you know, because Andy asked him. And the guy did the, the cards in the right manner mm-hmm. and he passed. Wow. Uh, and That's... so my son got hired and uh, Doc Lovey has uh, helped my family tremendously along with all a lot of other 506 families. With He's, he's a psychiatrist after the war and uh, uh, one time in uh, 
in Vegas. I think it was Vegas at a reunion. Went out to no, it was the 101st reunion. Uh, went out to a uh, guy that lived there for a cookout, you know, for invited guys. Doc was there, and I started talking. You know, everybody's drinking and what have you. And this one guy kind of looked like he was lost. And a young guy, active duty. And I went over and talked to him. And I said, hold that thought. I went over and got Doc. And I told him, I said, I didn't go into detail, but that guy needs help. Mm -hmm. And Andy went over, got him in a bedroom or whatever, talked to him. And he would do that. He'd set up shop to help guys. I I think the biggest thing I know with me, and I think it's with a lot of guys, uh, they don't want to admit there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like an alcoholic, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, And probably 20 years ago, uh, I came home from work and changed clothes got verbally nasty and the wife said mike you either get help or get the fuck out and i love her dearly so i said okay i'll go get help you know and started at the va had a good psychi- or psychologist mm-hmm. and you know you get a psychiatrist just for the meds mm-hmm. and uh up until probably mid last year I, I was still seeing a psychologist, and now all I do is, you know, psychiatrist once every three months or so mm-hmm. to renew the meds. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow, wow. So I, Andy Lovey is one of the people that made a big imp- imprint on me, and uh, a, lot of the, a lot of other people, too many to mention. <sighs> Lifelong impact, uh, not... not- like, yeah i mean wow what what a man what a man um these uh this is gonna be our last one we're uh coming up on two hours here i know i've had you talking for quite some time and we appreciate it greatly my dry um, thought my dry throat I, I, <laughs> I, I know i can hear it and if my throat's getting dry i, I know yours as much as you've been talking so I, we I appreciate it. <laughs> oh yeah Probably hey, if you want a good travel cup for coffee, Yeti. Mine's, this this thing apart. here, you put fresh brewed coffee in it, and it'll be scalding hot in 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. My uh, my roommate had one for college, and occasionally, since he was sleeping, sleeping late and didn't have classes in the morning, that's exactly what I would use, would sneak his out with my stuff and coffee, get back, wash it, put it up before he'd ever know the difference. <laughs> Uh, What's the last question? Uh, about size. We always are kind of interested considering y'all are humping so much gear. Um, Jason says he's a pretty skinny guy. Pretty, It looks like he was close to your build in Vietnam. How much did you weigh when you were running recon, and how much weight was the gear <laughs> you were carrying? <laughs> I don't think uh, Jason's going to believe this, but uh, uh, I think my – weight at the time of separation after uh uh, sog i think the uh, medical record shows i was like 161 pounds wow and i'm six three wow and i weighed my ruck one time in the 101st uh never did it you know (laughs) who hired the name but when I weighed it, it was 110 pounds. Holy cow. And that, you know, and plus <laughs> that is your rucksack. That doesn't count your load bearing Damn. equipment where you've got canteens, you got ammo pouches. You're carrying 500 rounds of uh, M16 uh, ammo. Uh, I mean, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and you wonder how you did it, but you did it. And uh, to, to speak to what you said a minute ago, 
you know, you, no, your knee injuries aren't service related. Neither is your back or your neck injuries or anything yeah. like that. That's not service related at all. Yeah. You know, but I understand the bureaucrats have gotten a lot better about this stuff, you know, uh, and the one thing, if there's young soldiers or anybody out there listening, when you file your claim with the VA and they deny you, don't get pissed off and, you know, sit around. Uh, appeal that claim. And I've talked to guys that got close to 150 grand in back pay, you know? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. because if you meet your deadline for appeal, if it takes 10 years from the first date of your appeal, you get back pay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it, it took my dad eight years to get on. And I mean, mm -hmm. he finally got up to where he was now. No, he was a hundred percent disabled VA rating, uh, but it took him eight years. So, I mean, the, uh, not, it's gotten a lot. And as you said, it's gotten a lot better now, a lot better. Yeah. I've had the back surgery. I've had the knee replacements. Uh, it's all now service connected. But, uh, you know, at the beginning, it was a, it was a uh, fight with the VA. Okay. The bureaucrats, huh? six foot, 150, or about the same. Heaviest truck I ever carried was probably 50, 60 pounds. That, uh, the, uh, there's a bar for minimizing uh, the screen or whatever that uh, I couldn't read it all. Oh, it uh, it said the 50 or 60 kicked his ass, and he said, you're tough as nails, no doubt about that. Hey, everybody had that, you know, kind of weight on them. You know, it's just, you know how you do it? God, if you can pick them up, I can put them down. Because the hardest part is, you know, lifting that leg up. And uh, the other thing is, you look around and they're just as tired as you are and you ain't going to quit if they're going to keep going. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, we love hearing from you guys. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's just amazing what, what, what you guys did during the military and after, and uh, we're, we're just appreciative to get to hear y'all share and, and answer questions that we have. And, we uh we greatly appreciate you spending uh, an hour and fifty one minutes. We just crossed the threshold. So, um, is there anything you would like to close out with before we shut down for the day? One thing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the opportunity. Actually, two things. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all active duty veterans, regardless of service branch. Uh, for serving this country, you know, you have my ultimate respect. Absolutely. Even the jarheads. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we do have some, some active duty uh, vets that do watch. I get messages and all of that. So hopefully today was not only the, the history side, people want history, but also people that uh, uh, may be dealing with VA or any issues can can get some help out of today's issue with you sharing. So, well, I mean, it, it's, uh, we covered all aspects today and I, I appreciate you going in, in depth like you did. We, well, so. again, I appreciate you offering me and the others, the opportunity, uh, cause maybe down the road, 30 years, a great grandchild or something can look at this mm -hmm. and see and learn something about their grandpa or great grandpa or whatever. That that was one of the things I wanted to to try and do. I know SOA does that at the at the at the reunions, but I, I'm not sure if every vet gets a copy. But I would I, I did that to where at least the men I know and were open to it, such as yourself, had grandchildren or, or family to where at least one day they could just type in your name and it pop up and, and be able to listen to you after you're gone. Uh, I know, God, I wish my father would have been able to do that, but. That's uh, partly what we were doing is to preserve legacies. And we uh, we appreciate the hell out of you spending two hours with us today, sir. 
and keeping those pretty dogs outside while they were wanting to get in with you <laughs> and tell them we're sorry for keeping them out so long. Ooh, so. The Rottweiler got mad. She uh, <laughs> pulled the screen door out of the... <laughs> I, I, I thought I saw her working on that, but I wasn't going to stop anything in, in case uh, she, she did something bad. But uh, we'll uh, we'll let you go. And again, thank you very much for this afternoon. We, we appreciate you You're sitting down with welcome. us. You're more welcome. And again, salute to all the veterans. Absolutely. Take All care. righty. Yes, sir. We're going to close out, guys. We will see you all later.